Bitcoin has showed us that we can do transactions now without having anybody in the middle. In the last three years, I have been fascinated by the topic, and I've been analyzing it, studying it, and it gave me a lot of flashbacks to what happened with the internet 20 years ago. And I wrote a book explaining the potential of the blockchain in the business blockchain, which was just released two weeks ago, and they are selling a few copies at the entrance here. Uh, it is one of the first books on the topic from a business perspective. And in it, I talk about unpacking the blockchain in many different ways. And one of the drawbacks that I've been observing uh, in the industry is that not everybody understands the potential of the blockchain in its fullest extent. Uh, there are many different aspects to it. Many just look at it as a distributed ledger or just as a currency or just as a technology, but there is more to it. And to really have a really good context, I like to say that you have to look at the blockchain as three separate pieces. There's a business piece, there is a technical piece, and there is a legal piece of it. So some people will look at it in the business sense and will look, see the business innovation potential. And some others will see it as a technology and they will start to develop applications, decentralized applications specifically. And some others will see it as a legal uh, aspect and then they will either be pro uh, changing the laws or they will say, no, we cannot change the laws. And here is this, the problem that I see right now in the marketplace. Some companies and some people are just taking whatever they like from the blockchain and not using other parts of it. So if you only take the technology part and don't use the innovation potential of the blockchain from a business side or a legal side, then you're only barely scratching the surface. And this is what banks are doing, for example. You hear about banks wanting to implement the blockchain, but in reality, what are they doing? They are just using it as a technology. Banks don't want to change their business models, and they don't want to change the regulatory environment that they live in. So their starting point is the regulations, and then they don't want to change the business model, so all they see the blockchain as is a technology. It is fine as a first step, but we should do more, and I challenge anybody, if you want to see innovation in play, if you want to see what the startups are doing, you will see that they usually have a three-pronged approach, looking at technology, looking at business models, innovation, and looking at legal innovation as well. But having said that, even some startups sometimes will just focus so much on the business aspect and, and not enough on the technology, or maybe they ignore the legal aspects. And you really have to look at all of them. When we look at the, because otherwise it's not going to work, but when you look at the going forward, at the centralization specifically, there is another way of looking at it, uh, and it's really all going to be based on the reconf reconfiguration of trust. Trust is the main element that is changing here, because the blockchain allows us to not use humans for trust, but rather use machines, or use algorithms, or use services, or use new applications that do not need people in the middle to conduct transactions. So the equivalent of reconfiguring trust or unbundling trust, as I like to say, is think of it as in a three-pronged three approach, humans, machines, and regulators. I'm not saying here that regulators are not humans. That's not why I didn't put them in the same, uh, like in a separate bucket. But uh, regulation is, is a fact of life, and we have to, to see how we live with it or how we change it. So I'm not saying I'm totally for not changing the rules, but here I am challenging the regulators to innovate themselves as well. So the innovation potential is not just in the technology itself. The innovation potential is also needed at the regulatory levels. So this is so important because this is a new phase of the Internet. The last 20 years, if you think about it, we've had personal communications, we've had publishing, we've had e-commerce, and we've had social interactions, and that was really the Internet of the last 20 years. We're just entering a new era now, which is based on the decentralization of trust, 
where value can flow without intermediaries. And that is a very significant era that is starting, maybe for the, certainly for the next 10 years, perhaps for the next 20 years. The next research that I'm doing is now on the topic of decentralization specifically. But before we go into that, I wanted you to make sure that you understand that the blockchain is a layer, is a layer on top of the internet. In the same way that the World Wide Web is a layer on top of the internet, and we've had it in the last 22 years, blockchain and blockchain applications are a new layer that can sit at par with the World Wide Web. So you can imagine we can have different flavors of blockchain applications. And some of them could be native to the blockchain and do not use the web necessarily. And some of them are a hybrid of a blockchain app combined with a web application. And since we live in a world of public and private domains, there will be representations of these applications in the public domain, and there will be representations of those applications in the private domain. And we have four flavors of blockchain applications, which is how I describe it, and it's covered in the book. In terms of going forward with uh, decentralization, which is really the topic I'm interested in discussing with you, the three pillars are around trust itself that is changing, wealth, wealth creation, and information. So let's dive into each one of them and see what is changing in each one of them. In the trust aspect, think of law, governance, and industry specifically. So we have to change the laws regarding the decentralization of trust. And the laws have to change, for, for example, if you're in the banking sector, the record-keeping rules do not take the blockchain into consideration right now. Record keeping has to go into a database that has to adhere to some standards. But we should change the laws so that the blockchain is allowed and is accepted as a record keeping, for example. Governance models. There's a lot of, there were lots of sessions at this conference about the governance models. I think there's lots of innovation in the governance models and including uh, governing organizations like distributed autonomous organizations or in terms of Government, government itself. And then finally, every industry is going to have to innovate within uh, itself. Uh, the banking industry is the one that kind of seems to have a lot of activity, but there is activity in the banking services, but I don't see a lot of innovation. They are applying technology. I think we will see more innovation in healthcare, in energy, and in government services. The second uh, sector, which is wealth creation, and here I'm talking about a real economic production, a real economic production. The, there's going to be a new crypto economy that is going to be born by just creating new services and new wealth straight on, on the blockchain itself, where work that is performed on the blockchain translates into value that is recycled into transactions. And I'll give you an example. Uh, there is an application called Lazuz, which is a, a, um, a ride-sharing application. Uh, it is not commercially available yet. They're still working on it. But the idea is that when you download the application and as you drive, it is collecting data about your driving patterns. And this data will earn you points, tokens, cryptocurrency, fraction of a cryptocurrency, which you can use to take a ride the next day, for example. So here, the example is that we've created a new microeconomy out of just work. And in this case, the work was driving. So we have so much data as people, as users. We have so much data about ourselves. Why can we not sell a part of that data and earn something in return? And then recycle that the value back into a transaction. So there aren't too many examples, and I'd like to see more examples where there is work that is being generated, results into a transaction, and stays within the system uh, in a cryptocurrency model. There's a new flow of value, which I just talked about. So when you think about it, money is value, yes. But value is not just money. 
any asset now is value. Any asset can go on the blockchain and can be uh, transparently transported at speeds, at the speeds of the blockchain. Uh, and then the third aspect was the, uh, uh, okay, so slides, oh, too fast. There's a delay, uh, sorry about that. The, okay, and the transactions, we're gonna have to see transactions specifically uh, on, on the blockchain and, and one way to do that is to, to measure them. And we're still in the very early stages of that. And uh, the, uh, the third uh, topic is information. Uh, for example, content, content decentralization, uh, content publishing that is decentralized. I, you, you can name any, any application that is a web application today, and there is an equivalent decentralized application that somebody is working on on the blockchain, whether it's content publishing uh, or, or content distribution specifically. So that's an important aspect. The second one, privacy. Privacy is going to be very important. And there, there's a difference between anonymity and, and privacy. Uh, I think there is a need for anonymity uh, and um, uh, for, for, for the right reason. It doesn't mean that you will hide from the legal authorities or that you will be a bad person. But uh, the blockchain promises that we will have our own identities on the blockchain. If you think about it today, who owns our identities online? Mostly it's Google or Facebook, because this is how you log into uh, all these online properties. But in the future, we should be able to own our own identities on the blockchain. And the identity on the blockchain is the starting point for a lot of innovation in terms of the applications that are out there. And finally, security. Security becomes a design requirement from day one. It is not an afterthought. It is something that is built into the decentralized applications where everything between the application and the user is encrypted. Everything uh, from the data to the application to the processing. And then you can share certain pieces of your uh, data with, with certain uh, entities that are authorized to see the information. Could be an example could be healthcare where uh, you, you might just provide uh, specific healthcare providers with your data, or maybe aggregate your data if there is a specific disease that you have or a specific, specific case and you want to see how you compare with others. So the blockchain holds that promise. There's going to be a lot of innovation coming out of decentralization that we want to see in the peer-to-peer -peer models and protocols. For example, uh, e-commerce. There's a company called Open Bazaar. I'm an investor, I'm on a board member as well. But Open Bazaar, as an example, is a, is a vertical protocol for decentralized peer-to-peer -peer commerce. And it sits on the horizontal protocol of the Bitcoin blockchain. And I'd like to see more of these protocols. Maybe every industry will have a, a protocol for a specific function that it does. And then once you have that, in this case, then you can conduct e-commerce without eBay. Uh, you can do business on a peer-to-peer -peer basis without having anybody in the middle. So think about all the savings in transaction fees or in license in listing fees. And uh, this is one of the examples that uh, is, is go we're going to see a lot more of. Uh, there will be some trust-based systems and services. Think of it as a dial tone for trust. I've written a recent article uh, for TechCrunch, which was an excerpt of the book, and it said the blockchain could be the next Google. What I meant by that is that the blockchain could enable the next Google. If you think about it today, when you want to look for information, you search on Google for services or for products. But in the future, we will be looking not just for information, we will be looking for truth. We'll be looking for transparency. We'll be looking for titles and ownerships and all of these services that are the proofs of something that is on the blockchain, where are, you, are we going to go? There will be an equivalent of a Google-like, but maybe the name will not be Google, it will be another company that will start to provide these services where you can go and check if somebody owns something, if somebody is telling the truth about something. You can check the history of transactions. You can check the history of the provenance of products. You can check if there was any fraud committed or you can check uh, all kinds of uh, services where there's a proof, 
where in the past you had to go somewhere and stand behind the counter or talk to somebody. And we're going to be able to do all of that on blockchains once we bind our identities to the usage. There's lots of talk at this conference about autonomous organizations, uh, distributed or decentralized autonomous organizations. I'm a little bit cautious here. I believe in the model, but I think we have to be cautious because we have to learn about the behavior of these decentralized organizations before we can put them on the freeway. It is the same thing as uh, having decentralized, uh, as having autonomous cars. Um, there's been a lot of testing right now to have autonomous cars where we start by allowing the car to park itself or to just be uh, hailed from a few meters away. And then it's all testing before we can take these autonomous cars on the, on the highway. And I think the same thing applies for uh, all the models around the dis decentralized uh, autonomous organizations. And I would caution here about not wanting to run too quickly uh, and assuming that we can have decentralized autonomous organizations from the get-go. It takes uh, some practice, it takes some tests. Uh, I'd like us to see how we can test these DAOs with small dollar values, uh, not with millions of dollars where the losses could be, could have some severe uh, repercussions on the whole system. And then finally, we're gonna see a lot of these new wealth creation methods and distribution meth methods like the case of Lazuz. I would like to see more wealth being created within the system, within small micro crypto economies, where work translates into a currency that can be spent on a transaction for a specific service, whether it's a driving service or whether it could be a banking service, it could be a storage service, file storage, for example, where if you loan some of your file system, then you will earn some tokens. And there are applications and solutions that are doing this right now. So that, that, that is what we should be looking for in terms of, of decentralization going forward. And we're still at the very beginning of the decentralization stage. And I think the best is yet to come. Thank you. Thank you, William. Um, hope you all enjoyed that and find the topics uh, William discussed interesting. Um, to get a little sense, how many in the room uh, actually use Bitcoin? Okay. Uh, how many are interested, or how many have heard of Bitcoin? Probably everyone? Yeah, okay. Are, are you more interested after this talk that Bitcoin and things like it um, you know, are, are going to push society in a good direction? Hands, show of hands, yes. Good direction, bad direction. Does anybody have reser So there's some reservations about this. Okay, good, because I, I have a slightly critical discerning eye to uh, Ward's blockchains. And um, so the nature of questions I have. Oh, also, does anybody have questions that they want to uh, ask so I can gauge my time? Two, three, okay. Um, so like one of the big problems with blockchains in general right now is the technical scaling. Um, whereby the size of a blockchain is a, is a file. Imagine it as a very, very large file that lives on um, computers. And uh, you, you, in the beginning of Bitcoin, anybody could run the full blockchain on their computer. Um, but now the blockchain has grown to about, I think, 65 gigabytes for the Bitcoin one. And that's handling very specific types of transactions which people are kind of using like money. But in a world like William's talking about where uh, government systems, all sorts of things start using blockchains, the scaling issue will become quite a big issue um, with uh, you know, the size of this file that allows for the de distributed trust. So how do you see that getting solved in a way that's done in a distributed fashion itself so that it's not controlled by, say, one big corporation or one big VC firm? Sure. I mean, the issue of scalability uh, is an issue that will be solved. Right. It is not an issue that is going to stay with us for a long time. I can tell you for a fact, uh, all of the uh, engineers and 
and uh, entrepreneurs uh, that I know in the space are very focused on the scalability issue. So it's, it's like, you know, usually you, like, you don't solve an issue that you don't have yet. Even the internet has scalability issues. Did you know that? If, if 50 billion things, Internet of Things, were to be connected to the internet today, it would crash. And we have to continuously upgrade the uh, internet protocol. And we do that as we see the problem. Now, I realize with the blockchain, we have some base level scalability issues we have to solve. And they will be solved on time. And then it will evolve from there. So I'm not worried about scalability being an issue for the long term. Uh, it is something that will be solved. That is very, everybody's focused on it right now. Right. Uh, I, I have faith that technically it will be solved as well. And that it, it, it's failing, but in a very graceful way right now. And the scaling will be solved. But I mean more so the social financial dynamics that, that bring about how this changes, right? The Bitcoin community is being kind of ripped apart at the moment, or it was, it's getting better now, um, from some people who work on it, you know, who have uh, investment from venture capital firms to build certain uh, extra technologies to solve the scaling problem that pull it in one direction, right? That increase, say, this one technical component of it. Um, but then there's other people who disagree and then they, uh, you know, and, and they, are, they also have financial interests that are bringing from where they're coming from. So yep. I guess the, the root of what I'm saying is like, how do we, how do you see balancing this sort of radical new tech that can change society and culture versus a layer that gets slapped on the existing venture capital corporate world? Or is it? I mean, it's either way. Well, I think we're gonna you know. see a lot of flavors of different, different types of implementations. The discussions you're referring to in the Bitcoin space specifically relate to what is called the block size debate, yeah. where there are many different ways to increase it and that will increase the number of transactions or the speed of the network. I again, I mean, one could see the glass as half full or as, the, as half empty. And I can tell you those that are serious and de developing blockchain applications, whether it's on Bitcoin or other blockchains like Ethereum, mm -hmm. Uh, are not very worried. Instead, they are they are developing the applications and they are pushing it forward. Like in the case of Open Bazaar, I'll use them as an example because they are the large one of the largest scale types of uh, decentralized applications. And in the first months, they've had 110,000 downloads, and there are users using them, and and it's working fine. Uh, you take the Ethereum side; there are more than 200 startups in the ecosystem, and many of them are getting funded now, and they are. Uh, uh, launching their services. So entrepreneurs uh, love a challenge. Uh, engineers love a challenge. You put five engineers in a room with a problem, they will solve it over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you give challenges to entrepreneurs and they will solve them. And, and whether it's uh, taking money from VCs or, or funding their startups in other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think this is, all, this is all very exciting at this point. Okay. Um. So maybe also elaborate more on the difference of privacy and anonymity and how that plays out in the blockchain space whereby um, so many startups in the current non-decentralized model um, exist because their business models depend on user data and, and, and mining user data and using this user data and selling this user data, um, which is both not favorable to privacy nor anonymity. Um, and Swinging this pendulum uh, away from that, where by a blockchain system uses is more respectful of privacy and maybe allows for anonymity. Yeah, I think in the future I, I can see a future where we can configure our own privacy settings ourselves and decide that for this particular service maybe we just give them this kind of data, for this other service we give them this other data, and and that that way you always know who has what data from you. And uh, anonymity is important because it has its own usages. Uh, for example, there are countries where if you say something uh, that is very open, then your, your life may be at risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, anonymity there is not to do something malicious or to do something illegal or to avoid paying taxes. I, I anonymity has a role in doing something good. And um, I think uh, we should be able to, within the same kind of... Uh, confine within the same system, say, well, I want to be anonymous for here, but not anonymous there, and I'm okay to share my data with this service or not. But what's going to drive all of this is the applications, mm -hmm. not just the identity element itself. If you think about it, it's like having a passport. Mm -hmm. What good is your passport if you don't travel? 
because it sits in your drawer and you never use it unless you want to go to an airport and travel somewhere. And, and the, the airport and the travel are like the applications for the e-identity, uh, and we need more of those kinds of applications. We're, we're running a little bit tight on time if you wanted to ask the okay. audience for um, a few questions. Good, good. Uh, yeah, I'll come over to you. Oh, you got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've been researching blockchain for quite, uh, I mean, quite a bit, and I've not seen anything regarding uh, moves from Apple or uh, Google or Facebook. Uh, do you have any news uh, about them? Are they sleeping? Or <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, th these are the big companies. The question is about if we're seeing anything from Facebook, Google, or Apple about the blockchain, um, it, it's very difficult to have a big company change, uh, whether it's a bank or an incumbent in, in the space. Uh, th their inertia is, is, is very limiting to them. Uh, I can tell you uh, for a fact uh, that uh, when, when I wrote last week the, the article in TechCrunch called uh, The Blockchain is the Next Google, uh, I received a call from Google. It is true, and they invited me to uh, come and speak to them at the Google Talks. And apparently I'm going to be the first speaker uh, talking about the blockchain at the Google headquarters next month. Um, so maybe I can tell you more after I present to them and, and see what happens. Uh, but it wouldn't surprise me that, that they are thinking about it. And, and then uh, uh, right now they don't think that it's, it threatens their model. Uh, but um, Airbnb, for example, has just hired uh, a number of uh, uh, people from a company called ChangeTip, who I had invested in. That was my first investment two years ago. And uh, Airbnb uh, took the uh, part of the technology and the people to, to them. Uh, because Airbnb is a good example of, of trust, of decentralized trust, which is based on reputation. If you think about it, the reason why you allow a stranger to sleep on your couch or in your, in your bedroom or in your house is because you know a lot about them before they arrive. And that is a reputation system at play here. And we're going to have the same kinds of reputation systems on the blockchain powered by uh, electronic identity where it all comes together. I think we have time for one more question, yes? So thank you so much. Such an interesting talk. Um, my question was around how um, this technology can be utilized by people who are non-knowledge workers. Uh, today, it appears that this is in its early phases, and so it requires a certain amount of intelligence, um, knowledge, perhaps an uh, appetite for risk to capitalize on even using it as a consumer, let alone as an investor. And it seems that it would, the logical next question would be, where is that layer and how is that layer going to be built to allow a broader use of the technology? And then where is that margin of um, profit or efficiency then being reapplied. So how is that benefit being given to the broader market? Yes. I'm not sure we're there yet, but I'm just curious as to whether you've thought about it. It's a good question. I mean, this is an, an indication of the fact that we are very, very early in, in the stage. And when I want to give examples, I, I keep sc scratching my head and I go back to Open Bazaar again. Open Bazaar is really an application where you don't need to know anything about the blockchain from a technological perspective. You just download the client, a piece of software, on your desktop, and you start to use it uh, as a buyer or as a seller. But we don't have a lot of these kinds of applications, and I'd like to see more of them. And uh, the best applications uh, using the blockchain are the ones where you won't even know that the blockchain is behind the scene, in the same way that you don't know whether a database is behind the scene or you don't really care about the kind of website, you just use the service today. And we're going to see the same thing. So even if you're an Open Bazaar user, you don't know that there's blockchain in, in there, except for the fact that the currency is Bitcoin, is Bitcoin at this point. And the currency is Bitcoin because it's a universal currency. It makes it a lot easier to buy and sell from anywhere in the world to anywhere in the world without worrying about the currency trans uh, exchange. Uh, but you're right. With, I'd like to see more, more applications. And then the blockchain applications will, s will start to look like web applications. Uh, so then we go back to user interface, user experience. So there will be, I think, lots of work for if you're in the UX, UI, now designing UX, UI uh, for blockchain applications because that's what drives usage. 
is a really great application. True. Um, are we out of time? Yes. Okay. Uh, there's one more? No. Quick one. Okay. I'll, I'll be quick if there is one more. Oh, okay. Sorry. Up front, at the front. front. We'll do one more. Quick question, quick answer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, could you elaborate uh, about the, uh, the, um, the business model of uh, Open Bazaar and why you believe in it? Short. Yes, uh, there's two parts of it. There's Open Bazaar, the protocol, which is free and will continue to be free. And there's OB1, the company that will provide services on top of the protocol. So the money will be made with OB1. OB and one of the services will be like an escrow service. Uh, escrow, where, for example, suppose I'm doing business with you and I, I don't trust you. We can put Brennan as an escrow, and, and then he will release the money, okay, only after I've received the, uh, the goods. And then he may take a cut of 1%, for example, instead of 35 for credit card and 5% for listing fees. That's one example. Okay, uh, that's it. Thank you very much, William. And, uh, Thank you.